Hello, everyone. Welcome to our next talk. We want to take a minute to thank our sponsors. Without them, Diana Initiative would not have been possible. So if you're uh, in Discord, please take a scroll down to the sponsors section and check out all of our sponsors in the Discord channels. There's some interactive content there, a couple contests to enter uh, for goods. So please check it out. And while you're on Discord, another important couple of announcements. Um, there is a really awesome Pet Picks channel. Um, I highly suggest you check it out because it just made my day so much brighter. So go check it out. And the last thing I'll plug is uh, the Career Village actually still has spots for resume review for the rest of the afternoon. Honestly, go check it out even if you're not you know, entry level because I just had a session and it was awesome even though I'm mid-career. Really super helpful, really amazing volunteers. So uh, definitely worth spending some time on. Um, and with that, I'm going to go introduce our next talk. And this one is uh, titled, um, Don't Settle for Less, Know Your Value. And I'm happy to introduce Arti Gadia and Sharifat Akinwanmi. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Uh, we are live, uh, so yeah. we'll play the video. I'm excited as I'm going to be making an offer to a successful candidate. Hello. Hello. Well, thank you for interviewing with us. I'm really excited to let you know that you were the successful candidate and we are going to be giving you an offer. And the reason is we found your background, your skill set, and expertise as a great fit for the organization. So congratulations. This is your offer. Thank you. Mm. Hmm. <laughs> Think about this situation. And what would you advise my niece? Should she accept? Do you think she should negotiate or reject? Audience in the chat box, we'd love to hear your comments. Love to see your comments of what you would advise my niece. From this lens, I can tell you that it is easy to give advice, but think about your situation when you've been in her shoes and how many times have you negotiated your offer? And when you did negotiate, what was the outcome? Jambo, namaste, konnichiwa, bonjour, and greetings to everyone, no matter where you are in the world listening to our talk. What an amazing conference, fantastic speakers, and thank you to all the volunteers behind the scenes. Thank you for joining us today at the Diana Initiative Conference as we cover such an important topic. Don't settle for less, know your value. Today, times are difficult. Inflation is rising. Things are getting really expensive. I can tell you my $100 bills are now $150 when I go shopping. And it will continue to rise as we see interest rates go up. There's a lot going on around the world. You heard from the keynote, an amazing keynote. And we've all seen research and statistics of the pay gap for underrepresented groups. The gap is even wider for women, for women of color, LGBTQ and other underrepresented groups. Change is taking place, but it is slow and we need to accelerate it. And in order to accelerate change, we need everyone's commitment. Otherwise, it won't happen at all. And that's why this year's theme is so important. Take the initiative. And through our talk, our hope is by the end of this session, you'll be able to apply some of the learnings to your journey because together we can close the gap. As we share our viewpoints, Please note that what we share today is our personal viewpoints and not of our employer. So let's start with introductions. Sherifed and I met during the pandemic when she had just moved to Canada from Nigeria. And even though we have not met in person till today, 
it's just been such an absolute pleasure knowing her as we share the same passion. My dear friend, Sherry Fat, I'll hand over to you to introduce yourself further. Thank you so much, Hati. And like you did, I'm also going to greet in my local language. I'm from Nigeria. And there are three main languages in Nigeria. I'm a Yoruba girl. So I'll say, Ekaro, Ekaso, Ekale, Ututuoma, Inakwana. I'm greeting everyone on the call. You're all welcome. And like Hati said, it's been a fantastic journey knowing you, Hati, since I came to Canada. Thank you for all you do. Um, I'm a new immigrant in Canada. And, you know, this topic, I'm so passionate about it because I know lots of immigrants come into the country or into other countries with the mindset of their country. And then when they are offered something, they grab it and they move on, right? Because they still have to compare from where they are coming from. So this topic is quite important to me. I'm so glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Yes, fantastic. And a little bit about me is, you know, my network knows me as a change maker and my purpose is to be a voice. And throughout my journey, I've dedicated my entire career to breaking down barriers and boundaries for underrepresented groups in STEM and in leadership. And I've done this through Stand Out to Lead and she sharing her empowerment where the impact of these initiatives has led to positive change. And when I was honored for my contribution in the cybersecurity industry by being named as one of the top 20 women in Canada, this actually inspired me to share my journey in the book, The Rise of the Cyber Women, Volume 2. I currently work for Times, and I'm pleased to share that they are one of the sponsors, and a huge shout out to all the sponsors that you saw earlier on uh, with the slide for their commitment at this conference. Uh, beyond that, uh, beyond Times, I serve on four different boards as an advisor for Observe ID, OS Vancouver Chapter, WESIS Western Canada affiliate, as well as the Women in Security Documentary, which is an exciting initiative celebrating amazing stories and moments of women and allies in our industry. Outside of work, I love cooking. I'm not the best cook, but I enjoy cooking. And you'll see me riding my motorcycle, so that's my helmet. So uh, from the video with my niece, I can tell you it's easy to give her advice, right? Sherifat, we were talking about this, so easy. And I sent a survey to my network to see how many chose the option to negotiate at their existing job. And if we go into the next slide, only you'll see the results, only 30% negotiated. And I will tell you, 20 years ago, I actually was in that 60% category. I did not make the ask because I felt I needed the job more than the company needed me. I did not know my value. And I was going through my, as I was going through my own safari, I decided, well, I need to do a little bit more research. Am I alone in this? Or are there others like me who didn't negotiate? And I got several answers. And I'm going to summarize it into four categories. First is fear. Fear of what the employer will think. There's that reputational risks or fear of rejection. You know, if I don't accept this offer, if I ask for more, they might just take it away from me and give it to somebody else. There's that fear, right? And then the second reason is imposter syndrome. A lot of conferences have got some great topics. There's one right after our talk about it. And it, there's... A lot more, like if you asked me three, four years ago about imposter syndrome, I didn't even know what it was. And I'm so glad there's a lot of awareness because at some point in my career, I know I've experienced imposter syndrome. And then the third reason of uh, what I hear from my research is assumptions. And the assumptions that you feel you need to prove yourself to the company first before you can make the ask. And then the last one, that uh, I've heard, and I, I know it applies to me as well, is I didn't think about it. I didn't know what my value was. I didn't know what my worth is. So these are four reasons that I've heard from my research. Sherifat, from your journey, I'd love to hear, have any of these objections like applied to you or anything that you can speak around? 
Absolutely. And while you were doing your introductions, I realized I didn't introduce myself. So I'll take a minute to do that. So my name is Sherifa Takimomi. I'm a business information security officer with TD Bank. Um, I have over 12 years experience in cybersecurity and I've done so many things. I decided to move to Canada in 2020 when I decided that, okay, this, this is the next phase for me and my family. And I my second job with TD, I've worked with uh, United Farmers of Alberta. I currently live in beautiful Calgary. Calgary is beautiful in summer and it's been fantastic. I mentor women in cybersecurity, um, trying to find their path and trying to make all of those decisions because I didn't get that kind of mentorship uh, when I was trying to find my way and my path in cybersecurity. Um, I'm a mother of three um, and married as well. And what else about me? I love to cook just like Artie. I love to travel and I love reading. So that's a bit about me. So to your question, Artie, absolutely. I can relate with all of those questions. And coincidentally, at some point in my life, I have experienced it. I'll pick on imposter syndrome. Um, back home in Nigeria, at my very first people, managed role with a company called InterSwitch. InterSwitch is a fintech company doing fantastically well in Nigeria. Um, they've grown so big now and grown beyond Nigeria into Africa. And I was asked, um, the, the recruiter reached out to me to come head the cybersecurity team back then and imposter syndrome came in, right? So even from the application, I felt I wasn't ready for the role. But it took me discussing with people, specifically with my husband, and he said, why not? Why are you even counting yourself out before going for the job interview? Go for this job interview. You were reached out to because they looked at your profile on LinkedIn and they found something in, in, in you. And when lo and behold, I went for the interview. It was fantastic. The, the my manager said, I think you're very good and they offered me the role, right? So I'm already coming with a mindset that, oh, I wasn't even adequate for this job. And so when they offered, I was ready to take the offer, right? But of course, again, because I always talk to people that I trust, I discussed with my husband and said, why not ask for more money? What is gonna be the worst case scenario? They're gonna say no, right? <laughs> and of course I asked for more money and it was a yes. So if I'd said no, I would have just been there. But because I talked to people and they, I got the advice and that supported my application, and I was able to get the yes and, and, and they accepted the, the, my, my demands and I was able to, to join the company. So imposter syndrome comes strongly. Another thing I had to your, to your four points is lack of information. So what I've seen when people quickly accept an offer is because they either basing it on what they currently earn and um, they don't actually know their worth. So to your last point, so I've seen some people just say, hey, I'm cool with 20% increase on what I currently earn. You don't even know if the company is ready to give you a 100% increase. The only way you can know is if you do that research, right? So you can reach out, you, 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 the, 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 the major problem is not knowing, not having enough information and that can um, make you settle for the first offer, right? So yes, I can totally um, um, resonate with what you said. All of this point, the fear of the job being taken away. Oh my God, the said I'm the, first best candidate at this interview, if I say no, it's going to go to the second best candidate. They are not going to meet my demands. But what do you stand to, to lose? Just say no, you know. So uh, those would be my additional points to your points, Artie. That's awesome. Thank you. And you're right. Just to expand on that last point, Chair, I you bring such an important point on, I don't know my value. And it's interesting because I believed, and many of us will be in that category too, I believe my value was what society made me believe what was my value. And I can tell you one thing is that it was underrated. Statements like, you can't get that role because you don't have that title or you're not good enough, made me believe that I'm not good enough. And that's why sometimes we go into that phase of undervaluing ourselves. And what we're going to do is, 
uh, in the next slide, uh, we're going to highlight, as you can see, we're going to address some of these obstacles to the five W's, the why, the who, where, when, and what. And as you can see on the right-hand side, there's a great statement I saw on social media that I thought was very applicable to our talk, which said, when you start seeing your worth, you'll find it harder to stay around people who don't. And when I feel low or something like that, I bring this statement back up to, to remind myself, right? If someone tells me something like that, you, you're, you're not good enough, I bring this back up. So it's such an important point, and I'm sure we can all resonate with that. So let's start off with the first point. Um, you know, let's start with why. Why and what is the impact knowing your value that can have in your journey or your safari? Sherry Fred, what are your thoughts on why is it important? Absolutely. It, you need to know your value because if you do not know your value, then you will always settle for something less than your value. It is extremely important to have a plan when negotiating, when going into a, an offer. If you have a plan, then the plan serves as your baseline, right? Your baseline, you've already researched the company, you've researched someone with your skill set, how much are they earning? You've used multiple resources, including speaking with people in the organization or similar organizations, doing similar things that you are about to go do at that job to know an idea of what they're hand. And I know this is quite tricky to do, right? When it comes to salaries or compensation, everybody does hush, hush. Nobody wants, but you can simply ask for a range. So if you feel someone is uncomfortable about telling you how much they hand, that will help you um, have a plan to know your worth, ask for a range. Say, okay, I'm not asking for the exact amount. Could you advise like, what is the range between this and this that you feel this company will be able to offer? speak to people, use resources online. It is extremely important because when you get that right, you stand the upper hand when you start your negotiation. You are speaking from a place of facts. So whatever offer or whatever offer is being bought, you're judging it's based on a particular baseline. So you need to have a plan. That is your bedrock. That is your baseline in which you're going to use to negotiate. If you do not know that, then you would definitely accept anything that comes your way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. Great, great points. And, and to add on to that, when you start thinking about what is your value or what is your self-worth, it's not just only about your strengths, but it's also about believing in yourself, as I mentioned earlier on, is understanding also how work plays a role to your purpose and what are the personal values that are important to you, right? It's important in seeing your self-worth before others tell you, because along your journey, as I said, in, in my situation, and many people that I hear, is society may weigh you down and make statements that you're not good enough. So people will value you less than what you really are. It is human nature, and we need to challenge that. We need to change that. You heard from this keynote as well uh, this morning, and I remember doing this leadership course, um, I think six years back, I actually rated myself lower because that was what I was led to believe. And when you know your self-worth and your value, you can address the obstacles we talked about earlier on, which is fear, imposter syndrome, and assumptions. And it will become easier to make the ask, right? Making the ask is not easy. I see some comments up there. It's not always easy. It's easy to tell my niece, negotiate, but it's not easy when you're in those shoes right and even though we're only 20 percent or 25 whatever the latest statistic is in our industry 25 percent of women we bring a lot of value to this industry because of our different approach as we see things through a different lens always remember this reason is the reason why you were offered that job is because they see value in you and what you're going to bring to the organization and we all need to make sure that the offer uh, reflects that. And secondly, it's also important to understand the impact that we've seen over time, which is a compounded, compounded effect. And I'll explain this with some numbers. I experienced it in my, in my own journey when I was new 
to the country uh, in 2005. And it took me a while. So I, in my safari, the, the gap widened for me and my colleagues because I actually started at a significantly lower rate. And I know that it's for me in my journey, it's taken me 15 years for me to catch up to where I should have been, right? And I know that had I started at the right level, every increase by now, you know, like, you know, like from the loss of a lower package, I've lost two years of salary, right? So let me, let me put some numbers there. There's a great article from Muse where they explain it really well. Two people, one, and they were both offered 100,000 uh, in salary. One person accepted it, the other person asked for a 7% increase and that was accepted. Now, let's assume everything's the same for these two individuals. They get the same promotions, they get the same journey, everything's the same, right? The person that started, and, and, and just assume everything is applied, over a 35 year period, the individual that started at 100,000 would need to work for eight more years to match the second individual who started off with a 7% increase. Eight more years. So when you look at those numbers and stats, it's interesting just to see, you don't realize, you don't realize how much of a difference or a gap it would be. So that takes us to the next one, is who's responsible to close the gap? What do you think? Yeah, Ati, and I think you, that last example you gave was so spot on and it was so clear for you to see the difference in you asking for exactly what you need. Over the years, we should all remember, like you said, that everything that will happen to you in that career journey really depends on your base, right? So if your base is right, increases is a percentage of your base. Promotion increases, whatever it is, it's going to be a percent. Even for companies that pay bonuses, right, is a percentage mm -hmm. of your base. So if your base is not right from the onset, you're going to be shooting yourself in the leg all over this number of years. So great example you gave there, Ati. Thanks for sharing for sharing that. I need to go read up um, that article. I haven't seen it. Uh, I'll look at it. So the question, who is responsible to correct the pay gap? Hmm, this got me thinking. Top of my head, I'll just say, yeah, you are the one, you know, you it's your career journey, it's your decision, it's you working, it's you that wants to hand the money. Um, you should be able to initiate. I've heard of a couple of companies where they have very good um, ethics and good um policies in place that irrespective of what, sh what, sh the, uh, what they're handing, they have a fixed amount they're going to give for the role. So even if you're coming with a low pay and, and, and they find you fit for that job, even if you have asked for a low pay, they will offer you what you actually worth, what that role worth. Well, majority of the company will not do that. So I'm leaving this responsibility solely on the candidates, on the delegates, to ask, you are responsible to correct that gap that you've seen. You know your particular situation. Um, if you're, if you, be, if you, unfortunate to work with a low gap, or with a low pay, or and you want to carry that on because you're putting your percentage increase on your low pay, it's still going to be low. So it's left for you to do the research and know what your work and then go for it. So I will say yes. While I'm tempted to say, let's put it on the employers to do the right thing. But guess what? The employer, they want to make the best for the business. They want to hire the best candidates at the cheapest rate available. But you mm -hmm. should also have your own objective. Your objective is that for your skills in which you've worked at to, to gather over the years and the experiences in which you've worked at to gather over the years, you want to be paid what is worth. So I'm not going to leave it on the employer's end, but I'm going to leave it on the candidates. I'll be interested to know what you think, Hati. Yeah, I, I can 100% agree with you on that one. It starts from you. And um, of course, we want to change the way the industry does operate today, that um, everyone, everyone should be responsible. And we shouldn't wait for legislation to happen. I mean, 
I, I've heard statements as well. It's it's not my job that falls under HR or that falls under so and so or that doesn't fall under me. I think it should be everybody's responsibility. Uh, today it isn't, uh, but again, I agree with Sheriff. Start start it with you then, right? If it doesn't happen, you need to start that. You need to initiate that. And if you are a hiring manager and you see that there is an unfair advantage in your team's um, pay, be a voice because you are in that position to make that change, right? If you're if you are an employee, back to what Sherry had said, make that ask, but ask in a way that matters, and we'll share a few tips shortly of how you can make those asks. And I'd like to add that one of the things that. I've been a big voice for transparency within organizations, you know, questioning organizations. I know many or companies say, hey, we fixed the pay gap, but you need to be able to back up your statement with that data to share to your employees. There are very few companies out there that have begun sharing data, but I'd like to encourage more companies to be transparent and share that. Sheriff, had anything you'd like to add? Yes, I would like to add about that, you know, and I'll share an experience in one of the companies. And, uh, you know, when we were given our, like, a yearly increase letter, it was written in there to say, this is confidential information. Do not <laughs> share your bonus. I'm like, oh, my God, this is the reason why employers will continue to have offer hands because we won't share that information. So putting it in a, in a documented letter that way, documenting it in, in a letter, in an official document, kind of makes it a policy. So if I discuss my, my, my bonus with you, Ati, if we're working in the same place, then I'm going against the policy. So I'm just wondering why employers like to do that is because they want to keep, you know, paying <laughs> the low, I don't know, whatever. But it's the onus is on you to make sure you demand for what you're worth and you can only demand for what you're worth if you have done your research and you truly know what you worth. which is the first w we have there to say why is it important to know what you're worth so that every other discussion you have will be will be based on that right because we have even though employers have their ways of trying to make salary discussions or compensation discussion, hush, hush, is still something known within the organization. People will talk and then you get to hear. I heard of someone who spoke with another colleague. Actually, she thought she got the best of her when she joined the company. And then about a few months down, she realized that she was actually at the bottom range of the pay and she became totally unmotivated. She was not happy with the work. And then she, 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 you know, and that carried on to she eventually left the organization, right? So to to employers as well, you do not want to hire and lose your your your, your employees from the onset. Give them what they want, right? Even if someone is coming with a low with a low pay request, but you know there's usually a budget assigned to each role, right? You know this person, this is the amount you should be getting. Offer that. It won't take anything away from the company because they already made budget for it, right? But if they fail to do that, you as the candidate, you own it. You own it yourself and go ask for what you deserve. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, I agree. This takes us to the next topic. When do you negotiate? Right? Uh, is this at the start? Is this at the end? And then the second part to that question is when you turn down an offer, what are your thoughts? Oh, interesting. Mm, so this, this is a dicey one, right? And <laughs> um, when do you negotiate? It's, it can be easily said that you negotiate when an offer is made, right? But taking a look at it now, and you, you will actually realize that the, the process of negotiation starts from that first phone call or even from the job application. Some applications, um, I think in the US, it's quite common. I, I live in Canada, it's not very common to see a job ad that has the salary in it. So the, they put up the salary already and you're looking at it and you're looking at what you want to earn and that does not match up. You immediately turn down that turn that down you're turning down at that point so 
you because and you can only turn down because you know how much you're worth which doesn't fall in the bucket of what they offer but mm -hmm. where this hasn't been stated when do you then negotiate uh, from the from the recruitment process you get a call from maybe the recruiter or from the hr or from the hiring manager i've seen different things happen in some cases the hiring manager calls first to just talk to you and see even if you fit for her or him or the recruiter wants to understand your level or if you fit and from that discussion sometimes they talk about compensation they talk about salary and from that point negotiation actually starts you they, they, so you 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 ask the right questions they talk about what they want to offer if it meets yes if it doesn't then you can you can begin to negotiate from that right um there's another school of thought that say oh when you're going for a job don't make it seem all about money at the first at the first um conversation you're having yes i agree but if the recruiter brings it up and say hey, so how much are you looking to earn i'm curious to know Ati, what would you suggest in that case should we jump and say how much you want to earn or what do we do yeah i mean if it was live and you were asking me say we're role playing that yeah. And what my and you're asking me that question, my re response just to just what I typically say is, I appreciate your question. And what is important to me is transparency within the organization. And I'd like to hear from you what the budget range is for this position. Exactly. We can pause and wait for them to share. And if you're still at the very early uh, spot of your conversations, think about it, you know, Think, is this in line with what your expectations are? And then secondly is, you know, you're still early in the sales cycle, or I call it sales cycle, but the, the, the conversations, the interview cycle, right? You're still very early stages, right? You still need to do homework of each other. So that's probably not the best time to start making your negotiations, but it's a good time to understand what the, what the range is so that a as you go further along the line uh, in the interview process if they like you you like them things can change at least you know what the range is and at least you know if it is still a little bit under your range right if it is a great company it has other things that you're looking for as, as sheriff had mentioned earlier on it it, it doesn't have to only be salary there could be other things that you'll see along the way that are important so yeah, back to your piece, uh, Sheriff. I, you know, just that's my response at the very start when someone asks me, and you know, I love this question because I'll tell you a really funny story. Is I'm in sales, and customers are always, always, always trying to negotiate the best deal for their company when they're buying one of the products. And you know what's really funny is in this question, it's it's always this question about how much does this product, uh, how much is this product? And it's always the first question in, in the, my first, not first, but it's always in that first meeting that I have with them. And, you know, when asked, I openly share the range of what our solution is, right? And that even though I, they're not yet buying, they haven't even seen a demo of the product, but they ask those questions. And the good news is that, you know, that some places you, you can, while you cannot, that, you know, like, you can't ask what people make because I know there's legislation in place where some states or some countries have that. So I know during our time, they used to ask us these questions, what do you make? And you also needed to prove what you had, like what your offer, what, what your existing offer is. So I'm glad for place, some places that has been removed, right? Uh, but, you know, if you, if you see that scenario, right, it's the same concept, right? It, you know, a lot of people ask that question. So when you're in an interview process, you know, it's okay to turn it around, turn the table around and ask them that question. And I hear so many managers or, you know, who do ask what is your salary expectation, you know, just just ask them what is that budgeted, right? And even if it's less than what your expectation are, if you go along and like something about that company, there's, there's a reason why you're having those conversations, continue those conversations. If it's completely way off, I'm not saying continue those conversations, have those transparent conversations and let them know as well. So they're aware of what the industry rate is, because sometimes um, that may not be uh, information that is that is available to that organization or they haven't done their research or they're looking for a different candidate that 
you may not uh, be the right fit or they might not be the right fit for you. Um, and, and one other example, right? Um, I'll share two stories actually on this, um, on when to uh, negotiate. So there are two stories. One is an individual that I asked recently and I said, hey, did you, did you negotiate your existing offer? And she said, no, because they asked me what my range was and they gave me the top end of my range. And I was like, okay, that's great. But did you ask the company what their budget was? And so they, she said, no. Um, and I'm like, what, what if you were in the lower range or, you know, way below that range, right? And that got her to pause and to think like, yeah, actually, right? And I'm not saying be greedy or anything like that. Just see what your value is and see what, what it matches. And then there was yeah. another example um, is uh, my sister-in-law. She, she, she shared this example to me. She's new in uh, the U.S., and she was asked, um, now in her industry, it's very transparent. So you can see how these two conversations are very different. I mean, similar, but you can see the outcomes very different. She was asked the same question. She's like, there's this uh, level one, level two, level three. The pay range was clearly visible between the three. And she was asked this question, what um, level do you see yourself fit in? And her answer was, I think I'm a level one. Um, and I'd like to know more and we can assess this towards the end in terms of the role and the discussions we have. Towards the end of the conversation between her and the manager, the, the hiring manager during the interview, at the end, what happened was the interviewer or the manager said, actually, based now that I know what your skill sets are and what you what your value is, what you're bringing to the table and your experiences and things like that, I, I feel you're a level two. And so she was offered a job based on a level two, despite her being, um, you know, despite her looking into applying for a level one. So that's, you know, that's my thoughts. Uh, Sherry, if I have anything to add on that, and I'd like to also hear when you turn down an offer. Yeah, great, great examples. I'm going to pick up on your first example. And I think mm -hmm. some of the audience may actually be also have this question, right? And it's about when you have kind of committed to an offer and then you go back to do your research and you see that, oh, I can actually ask for more. Can you go back and renegotiate, right? I know it's a situation that can be avoided if uh, we took the tip in which you gave, which means turning back the question to the recruiter to say, hey, what is the range for this role, right? Mm -hmm. But in a case where that hasn't been done and you have given a, a, a value to a, a, an amount or a figure to, to, to the recruiter and they latch on to that, and then you go back to do your own work and you realize, oh my, I could have asked for more. What do you think? Is it advisable to go back and ask for more? Would that not be greedy or asking for too much? Yeah. You know, it, it, and back to your point, as long as you've got reasons and you've prepared, which is one of our tips we're going to talk a little bit more about, as long yeah. as you've prepared uh, and you're giving your reasons. I know in my situation, um, it was clear and transparent. Now, I didn't give what I wanted, but it was clear uh, to them that at the same time, I was in other interviews and I was also aware of what the market rate is, right? So it, again, it depends situation to situation. Yeah. Can you go back and ask? It gets harder because, you know, when you've already said this is what I'd want and then now you're going back, it can be perceived differently. It mm. can get harder um you know later on uh, but if you've got enough compelling reasons uh, just like when you are in an existing job and you're going to ask to um, get a, a raise or a pay increase give your reasons and just put your homework together of why you're asking for that don't just say i want more because i just you know um, feel i need more or or show yeah. that greed just do your homework mm -hmm. Okay, so I think we can move to the next one. So where do we find resources to know how much you're really worth? Do you want to go for that, Ati? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. One thing, though, just I just wanted to highlight the previous one with when to turn down an offer. Yeah. This is an interesting one. And just, uh, just a quick thing is, is that if the company, like, I know I've turned down offers. And the reason why I've turned down offers 
is if the company does not align with my values and no matter how attractive the offer is, I've got offers that have been a lot more than what I have, I've turned them down. And this mm -hmm. is something that you will know during the interview process. Um, so like, for example, I remember uh, one of my interview processes where I met with an executive and I, I saw that um, how that executive treated his, his uh, PA, his personal assistant. I didn't like that. And so I decided, you know, that's that's what I'm seeing from a culture perspective of what the leaders are. That's mm. the, no, no, that's a red flag for me. Another one where um, uh, the other one where I did turn it down, where within the within the organization, I was asking those hard questions of diversity, for example, like, you know, um, asking those direct questions based on what I'm seeing from an external perspective. And everyone within the organization said, yes, we do need to work on our diversity and we need to, um, you know, uh, broaden on our, um, our, our, the way we're going about hiring versus just, you know, who we know and things like that. And one of the interesting comments that when I had gone to the next stage of the interview, I'd asked to speak to uh, one of the executives. Um, and when I asked the same question and they answered, we don't have a diversity issue. So it gave me two red flags. One is of course, the organization thinks differently. Um, and there's a clear communication gap, but it just mm -hmm. makes me to understand, um, you know, that's a big red flag for me. It doesn't align with my values. Absolutely. And as you were saying that, I remember recently I got three job offers before I decided to go with TD Bank. And I'll share that quickly as an example. And it also boils to the first point on knowing your value. So when we talk about value, it's beyond just the dollar and cents, right? Mm -hmm. There's some other aspects that really matters to you, right? For me, it was important that I should be, I should have flexible working. So I should be able to work from home. And so that was top of my list. I had a list actually, and then I put all of these three companies against that list and I scored them. So took this company A, company B against my list because of these are the things that matter to me, one of them being compensation at this amount, another being work from home, another being the culture um, that are actually walking the, 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 the talk and not just talking about diversity and inclusion, um, another being, you know, reporting mm -hmm. line, another being the leadership of the company, and I rated all of this company. And when I looked at the scores, it was clear with facts which of the companies I should go for. And mm -hmm. you know, that was a personal thing I did that helped me to select the job offer um, out of the three job offers th that I had. And I had to turn down the remaining two. Of course, politely with reasons um, that I was able to get because I did all of those homework I was able to turn down those offers. So, so yeah, so I could relate with, with turning down the offers when they actually do not meet your expectation, which in your case, it didn't even have to do with the money. It was the way the leadership was and the way he treated his PA. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a no, no, definitely. Um, yes, and back to your question on the next part, Sherifat, is where to find resources? Um, Yes, there's Glassdoor, and there's a lot of information there that you can get. Um, you know, just Googling and things like that. You know, you get employees sharing that, you know, information or salaries and things like that. But back to your point, it's just um, take that initiative back to the conference team. Take the initiative. I've reached out to my mentors. I found mentors who are, um, I'm in sales, so CR, uh, chief revenue officers from other organizations, and I, and They've, these mentors of mine have helped me see what I don't see myself. And we have these conversations. And, and I asked them the question, you know, looking at similar sizes and industries, what, what is, you know, what, what is the compensation like for, you know, individuals with this level of experience, or this level of expertise, uh, this level of, you know, um, what they've been doing, success, or whatever that case may be. And, and having those conversations, I know, with mentors or other uh, executives within the industry that are open and willing to share have helped me uh, you know with with those discussions and i echo what sheriff had what you said really echo what you said which is it's not just only salary because i know i've taken less salary because 
it's the culture that that is very high on the list for me it's in and many times when it's a good fit trust me the organization will come back even if it doesn't meet the expectations it will they will come back with alternative options like uh more stock option i know in my case it was more stock option which which i like and i'm okay with that right or more vacation days or more flexibility so you know there's plenty of places where you can find resources for me that what's really helped is um my mentors for sure what about you share that absolutely and i was just going to talk on that last point in which you made um apart from using the numerous sources online talk to people right mm -hmm. in cases where you can find someone on the inside that you could say oh see so yeah, i'm i'm being i'm talking to people in your organization about this offer this is it this is it what do you think uh, is the salary range this is what i'm asking for what do you think talk to people and they will give you insights into this information you need to to do your research and and in addition to all the numerous sources online glassdoor that can provide salary range linkedin and some adverts talk to people, network, and that's where the power of networking comes up. If you have not built a relationship period to that time, it's going to be difficult for anybody to give you this kind of insights, right? And I remember when Ati and I met um, in, in a common group um, for women in cybersecurity, I didn't even know I was going to come to Nigeria, uh, to Canada from Nigeria. And getting here, Ati was, you know, she held my hands and put me through. But guess what? We built that relationship years ago before we, 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 really, we really got, I got to Canada and she was able to support my journey. And we met online, right? So it connects to your networking, right? Network with people, reach out to people. If you're an introvert, it doesn't stop you from networking, right? And so I just wanted to add that that um, networking helps you to find the right information. Um, yeah, that, that, that you ordinarily cannot find online. Mm -hmm. That's such a good point on networking. Exactly. And asking people. Right. And it's, you know, back to your earlier point, it's always so hush hush. Right. And, and that's how it's been for a very long time. But you look at some of the other industries where my husband works in, in a credit union. Everything's just so transparent. Everyone knows what they make. So why are we hush hush, right? So I don't know, I don't get it. It's time we start changing, changing, um, changing the culture, changing changing the, what has been there for so many years as that was the norm. We've got to change that and challenge it, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so tips. Okay, I, I, I guess I can go, uh, go through uh, tips. We've said f uh, four simple tips. We'll just share some tips as we go along. It might be more than four, but uh, hey, uh, additional tips are always great. Mm -hmm. So here, you know, the first tip I would share is be fearless and make the ask. I know it's hard. In, in, that, in that video you saw with my uh, niece, right? I'll tell you something which is really funny is, and for those who have kids, nieces or whatever it is, when my niece, and even for you in your own journey, I know when I was younger, I'm in the same boat uh, about being fearless, is, um, you know, her, her, her parents have just, uh, you know, been, you know, yelled at her or she did something wrong. And guess what? And, and I've seen this live. And literally after, you know, she's been told off about something she did uh, that was wrong. Uh, there's a, a chocolate on the table there. And then right after that, she goes, hey, mom, dad, can I have that chocolate? And I'm there sitting, cringing, like, oh, my gosh, that's not a question you need to ask at this time. <laughs> she's fearless because in her head, she's like, what are they going to say? No. no. <laughs> right? And over time, I don't know where it has the fear has injected in our journey because think of yourself as that that child you know and i know i've been there and i've been fearless asking openly despite having been yelled at right so same concept and i'm saying i'm not trying to say be greedy yeah right what i'm saying is make the ask but make the ask in a way that matters right in my career i've seen that 95 percent have started off with a lower package for those who haven't made the ask. And this is where it leads me to tip number two. 
which is the saying, fail to prepare, prepare to fail. And do your homework, as we were talking earlier on, right, Sharifat, as you asked me that question, you know, when is it right if you, if you have to renegotiate and things like that? If you're going back to renegotiate, make sure you prepare, make sure you do ho your homework and find out more information. Don't have that, don't go in with a negative attitude. Focus on your value and align it with the company's values. You've already reached that stage in the interview and you have the right to bring your feedback. And you will know from that the company culture. That will give you a good indication of how the company reacts to your feedback. If you're taking it as a way and a form of feedback, it changes the whole conversation versus going with a negative attitude. And then just one last thing, which I like to bring up a lot. Um, and a lot in my earlier days, I was told I needed to change who I am. You brought this great point, Sheriff, about you don't, you don't, you know, even if you're an introvert, you can still network. And I have been an introvert. Um, and I know in sales, they're like, well, if you're an introvert, you can't do well in sales. And I prove people wrong. And I didn't get jobs because of being an introvert. But hey, don't let don't tell, let people change who you are. If that's who you are, stay true to who you are. Be authentic. Be yourself. Believe in yourself. And when you believe in yourself, you know your value. And this can help with fear or imposter syndrome. Sherifat, I'm handing it over to you to hear your tips. Absolutely. So first thing first, <laughs> you know, don't accept the first offer. Do not accept the first offer. Like the case of your niece with a chocolate bar, you know, she said, I want chocolate ask for what you want and they're gonna say yes or no right and a company who has offered you a letter or offered you a position they talked about it right they are not just gonna forget about you because you asked for more money they are gonna go into negotiation with you they're gonna talk about okay can we meet this yes we can this is what this is these are the other things we can meet and then you can choose from that so first things first don't accept the first offer when you see that offer take a deep breath thank them ask for a day or two and you provide a response within that day or two think through the offer think through what you're worth because you've done all of those research you have the baseline which you're working with you think you and you're able to then present what you want and then they will look at it then the, the other tip I would share is practice, right? Negotiation sometimes you need to, you may get into some negotiation, negotiating discussions and they won't be very easy, right? You need to practice. If you know you want to go negotiate, find someone to practice with and say, okay, think of the possible questions and then prepare your answers ahead. Like, okay, so why do you think you want this much money? Go there with facts the skills, the additional value you're going to bring, the skills that you've done, the experiences, how much you're worth or how much competitors of that company or what's the industry saying about that position. Practice your negotiation speech and go into that negotiation very well. And then finally, I'll say know when to stop or when to walk away. So you cannot turn the negotiation into a back and forth and then you're going asking for 2K. Know when to say, okay, I've asked for this amount. The company has come back to say, this is what we can do. Look at it and say, yes, I'll go with this. Or no, it's a no-no for me. And that's it. So those, those would be my additional um, tips to what you said. I see some questions coming in. So do we want to... You want to add anything to that, Ati, before we go to the questions? I'm good. Let's uh, let's go ahead and uh, get the questions, and then we can wrap up because we've got seven minutes. Yeah. Okay. So I can go ahead and read the first one. It says, let's say when negotiating, they say they have an ad stop at so-and-so price. What else can be asked for compensation? I think this is a good question. Ati, do you want to give a try? Yeah, or? yeah absolutely. Think about what's important to you, right? If it means flexible days, um, I know there's this whole concept of hybrid, working in the office, working at home. Is that important to you? Is um, the ability to uh, 
uh, for example, like for, for in my case, stock options, if, if it's a private company, you can negotiate that. Another one, which I know in the beginning, uh, when I first moved to Canada from uh, the UK, I was so used to 35 days of vacation. I come here and it's three weeks and I'm like, what am I going to do with 15 days? So for me, what was important <laughs> is I need an, an extra week of vacation because my family's back home and I can't, you know, go fly to UK and Kenya in, in, in those three weeks. Three weeks. Too, it's, mm-hmm. My three weeks is gone, right? Yeah. And you know that being, you know, flying all the way to Nigeria, it's a long flight. You've mm-hmm. lost four days going, I mean, two days going, two days coming back and yeah. that's gone. Exactly. So there's so many different things. Back to think of what is important to you. And as you think about what's important, whether it's flexible hours or, hey, you know, um, on Friday afternoons, uh, I want to finish early or something like that and have those conversations and ask them, um, you know, what what they're willing to do for you. Yeah. And what in addition, you? you know, if it's a company that offers stock options, you can ask for that. You can ask for an increased uh, percentage in your bonus. Uh, yeah, more vacation days, like you said. The benefits, right? Can they do something around the benefits? Maybe give you a better benefit if dental is not included. You can ask for that. So these are some of the other things in which, if they've said absolutely no, they can't add that, add more to your compensation. What are the other areas in which you can negotiate everything? Leave days, vacation days, uh, benefits, stock options, whatever they they have to provide, you can actually negotiate. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, like for, I think in the US 401k, we have it as RSPs and things like that. Those are all things that all add up, right? Your yeah, retirement exactly. savings plan. So um, I see another question here. Mm-hmm. I've been pushed a lot to give my current salary. It seems a taboo. Would you walk away for that practice? <laughs> Should I give an attempt? Yeah. So I, w- I wouldn't. Depending on the offer, right, if I'm being pushed to give my current salary and from what we said, we've advised against that and they're refusing to give me the range of whatever that role is worth, it tells a lot about the company, right? I'm looking back to see, okay, why are you really, really pushing for for my salary and when I've asked for you to give me the information. So if they're pushing that, first thing first is turn the table around, flip the question to them to say, how much is this role? How much are you willing to to, to offer for this role? I think it will be hard for uh, a recruiter or HR or whoever to tell you, no, we are not going to tell you, we want you to tell us our salary. Oftentimes, they'll come back and give you a range, right? And that gives you a starting point, an idea of where to start from. Um, If they continue to insist and say, no, you have to tell us how much you are earning, I don't think you're obligated to give that information. And you can say that that I I, I don't feel comfortable to give that information. If they do decide to take off their offer because you don't want to give that personal information because it's personal information, You really need to check if that's the kind of company you want to work with, okay? Yeah, I agree with you, Sheriff. But I mean, I would wonder why do they need that and and they they corner you into that. And to your point, I was, earlier days, there was that, you know, standard people were asking that. Um, And over time, the the key thing that, back to that interview example uh, that I used, I appreciate your question. And what's important to me is transparency within the organization. And I'd like to hear from you, what is the budgeted range for this position? If they would still really push you back, and I would say, I would love to, again, back to transparency, I'd love to understand why this is important to you right now at this Mm -hmm. stage. You know, ask them, because this is where, by asking those questions, you're actually trying to understand and learn the company culture. Are they transparent or not? And is this the right fit for you or not? Mm -hmm. Uh, Again, it depends more on that situation. Will you walk away, will you not? How are they, here's how how they're addressing those answers based on how I'm questioning would determine whether I'm going to stay or I'm going to walk away. I know we've got only two minutes. (laughs) About a minute. So the last question is, what are some good resources for learning how to network with people? Do you have any you want to suggest? 
Yeah, network. Uh, there's LinkedIn, just uh, been connecting with lots of people on LinkedIn. Important, this conference, take advantage of this conference for networking. You heard this earlier. All these conferences is amazing opportunities. Volunteer, volunteer at all these different, the Dan Initiative is always looking for volunteers to help backstage. Great opportunity to volunteer. That's a quick high level. There's a lot more. Reach out to me personally, but I'll let Sherry Fat to answer that from her perspective and close. Absolutely spot on what you said. I use LinkedIn a lot. I volunteer. I attend conferences. I meet people on Twitter as well. I'm on Twitter and, and you know, meet great people on Twitter and reach out to people. Just, you know, do, do all of these things. And when you network, try not to immediately ask for what you try to get to know them. I'm cautious of time. I think we are out of time now. But yes, feel free to reach out to us and then we can share more tips. I've really enjoyed this experience. Thanks everyone for having us. And thanks Artie for inviting me to go speak with you. And thanks to the Diana Initiative. This is fantastic. I really, really enjoyed this. Artie? Thank you, everyone. Right. Thank you so much to Artie and Sharifat for sharing. Um, I really love that they talked about uh, company culture as well being a factor in um, in knowing your worth and exploring job opportunities. Really fantastic points there, lively Discord discussion. So we're going to roll into a 30 minute break. Um, and the only thing I'll add to that is um, just thanks again to all of our sponsors. Um, while the break is going on, the villages still uh, have active channels in Discord, so please pop on by. Um, I think Korea Village still has some resume review slots open, so go uh, go drop a drop a hello in there. Um, obviously, check out the Pet Picks channel um, and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thanks. <laughs>